Hey board game family, I'm here with another playthrough and review of Viscounts on the West Kingdom. This is designed by Shem Phillips and SJ McDonald and published by Garp Hill Games. This playthrough may be a little bit longer than some of the others, so if it is, I will split off the play portion and just give you guys my rules instruction and then my review at the end of the video. Let's so watch the timestamps and let's head down to the table and begin. All right, so currently I have set up for a solo bit game, which is very similar to a two player game. Uh, each player will have a mat with buildings set in the corresponding places. They'll have a deck of cards with the corresponding color that matches your player. And every player does have the same initial set of cards. Then we have virtue tokens on the other side. And before you begin the game, each player will be drafting a set of one card that, that looks kind of like this, that has the red numbers on top. This gives you starting resources and sometimes additional things like a building and a starting location, as well as a leader card that has a brown um, bar on, on it. And those car uh, the leader card gets shuffled into your deck, claim your starting items and place your leader this cool meeple, the guy on the horse here, and the flag, on this correct starting location, and uh, then you'll be able to begin. So the objective of this game um, is to do one of four different actions on your turn. You'll be acquiring resources, you'll be building buildings, writing manuscripts, and going in to visit the castle. And I'll cover those actions more in detail. Uh, the interesting end game condition, though, is once one of these sets of cards runs out, we have a uh, deeds and debts. So uh, what happens is that there are a certain number of deeds or debt cards placed on top of the pile based on the player count. And a dividing card showing what, um, how, how many of those are placed on top. Once one of those decks is completed to the point where that card is revealed, it will then be flipped, showing that the opposite color will score for endgame points. It could be that they are both flipped by the end of the game, in which case both will score. But it's an interesting push and pull because you want to acquire and then also flip over cards of one type, but you want to drive the other one to an end so you can get some points. There will be bonus points for collecting sets of manuscripts as well as to be the first to place their, uh, their knight or their soldier or whatever in the center of the castle. All right, so once we're ready to begin, uh, I'm gonna flip over this card and also shows you some additional rules, reminders, and in game scoring, because you'll be scoring uh, sets of manuscripts and points for people in the castle, as well as you'll see buildings also score points. Anything with a little yellow flag on it will score points or a little yellow banner, but if there's a line through it, that means it's negative points. You'll, for example, this deed that you'll see is worth negative two points on one side, but if I manage to flip it, I will gain a resource on the other side. Actions that happen immediately will have a lightning bolt symbol on them. Things that score or trigger the end of the game have a little flag. If they have an X, that means that they will happen when they fall off the board, which I'll get to in a moment. And if they have a little uh, rotating circle, like this guy over here, that means that they will take effect as long as they're in your play area. So how do you play? A turn starts with you selecting one of the three cards you have in your hand. And each of these cards will have a cost, shown in the top left corner a number of icons down the left. The name, of course, uh, an action or something that happens, and then how it happens, which I just covered about whether it's instant or whether it's long as this card is in play. You're gonna select one of these cards and you're gonna play it on your player board. If there were cards here previously, they will get shifted down, in which case cards with an X on them, if once they fall off, the end and land in your discard pile, then the ability gets triggered, the fall off ability. If your deck runs out, you'll be 
when it's time to redraw new cards, you'll be shuffling your deck and always redrawing your to your full hand size at the end of the game at the end of the, each turn. But mo a very overlooked rule is that whenever you shuffle your deck back in like back into your deck, you have to advance either your virtue or your sin token based on whether you have any amount of these got kind of, these skulls. These purple skulls represent nefarious characters working in your kingdom. If you have any of them, you advance the black token when you shuffle. If you have none, you advance the white token. And we'll get to what happens when those meet in a minute. So let's see, I'm gonna put a couple of starting cards out here. And you'll see after you place a card, so say I'm gonna play the journeyman. He has a value of two. That means that um, he would normally cost two to acquire, but since he's already in my deck, I don't have to pay it again. But the cost also dictates how far you have to move uh, at least that number of spaces during your turn. So I'm going to take my guy, now that I've placed him, and I have to follow the arrows and usually a couple different choices and move two spaces, or I can even pay a silver for each additional space I want to move. So I'm gonna move one, two, and end up over here. Then you're gonna take an action. You have a few different choices of actions based on where you are. If you are at a location that shows these blue merchant icons and an arrow towards something else, you can take a merchant like action. In which case you'll add up all the merchant icons that you have revealed on your board. There is some pre-printed on your board for a, kind of a quick start. And you may have additional ones that have been granted to you by things like a rewards card for having the first of the first person to get three blue manuscripts will have a permanent upgrade of two. Or there are also certain buildings that when built will reveal icons adding to the action. So when you take an action, you always look at all the symbols that are currently revealed in your play area and then add them up together and following the ratio, you will convert them into the action. In this case, it is four merchants to flip a card, uh, one of these little red or black cards. And if it's a black card, of course, you will gain the resource of your choice immediately. Some of the actions, uh, the merchant actions, you can also choose to pay a silver to represent additional merchants. Uh, this is the, the only action that you can kind of pump up with silver. Uh, each of the other actions has a different resource type associated with it. Um, so there is even an action that allows you to spend a merchant icon for silver. Uh, so you could get a, a lot this way. In this case, I would get one, two, three, four, five silver if I took the, um, the silver gaining action on this turn. Any skulls you have, these nefarious characters, count as a wild symbol towards whatever action you are going to take. Now, they do, whenever you play a skull to your board, you will have to move your, your, uh, your sins token over one. So you do have to watch out for that. As well as whenever there's a clash, you may have to move as well, depending on where things are. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, watch out for any of these little lightning bolt symbols that take place as soon as you play a card to your area, or these, these revolving arrows that mean that it is an ongoing action. For example, the trader, whenever I trade, I get a silver, which is quite nice. So that is the, the trade action. Now let's try, that can be taken only from wherever there is a trade action visible. Uh, now let's try a building action. So I'm just going to dig through my deck here to find an example. All right. So the laborer here has a build symbol. So I'm going to place that. I'm going to move two spaces. And now I can build a building. Buildings can only be built when you are on the outside of the ring. And there has to be available locations in these little squares. Now how you decide whether it's available or not, you'll take the river that is in the middle line separating each of these separate areas and the edge of the tile. And that is the range that you may build within. 
The cost of the building is shown on your player board and it is paid in both symbols and the stone resource you can use to increase. So in this case, I have two symbols revealed and I can pay an additional stone to bring it up to three, allowing me to, be, to build one of these little houses. As these buildings are placed, you will gain the bonuses shown. If you have connecting buildings, or even if another player has one on the other side and you built one, you will both gain the connection that's in between the, uh, the bonus, uh, or if they are both yours, you will gain it one time. Also, upgrading buildings uh, or building buildings upgrades what you can do in your turn. Uh, for example, like I showed earlier, building some of these buildings will reveal certain symbols, meaning that those actions you take later on will be stronger or potential other things like being able to move an additional movement. I have this building not placed currently, uh, in case you're wondering, it's already in the board because my starting conditions allow me to place an, extra, uh, an additional building where I start off. Uh, we also have gaining a coin, whatever you, or uh, sorry, rec um, hiring a worker always costs a coin. Uh, we've recorded this one, some different resources. We have being able to dismiss a card uh, from your hand, so you can discard a card. We have moving the, um, the virtue up whenever somebody clashes. And we have an, having an increase in your hand size. All right, so let's head back up here and cover some of the other actions. I also uh, mentioned uh, that when you are taking an action, there are different piles of cards on each of these uh, different little boards that are assembled together. You may choose to dismiss the worker or the, um, the character who is at that location to temporarily gain their icons towards the action you are taking. The cost of dismissing is the, the, the cost in the coins and you immediately get whatever is written in the top right corner. After you take the action, instead of dismissing a card, you can choose to hire a card. Or even if you did dismiss, you can hire the next card. Also paying the same cost, gaining the ability in the top right corner immediately, and then adding the card to your personal discard pile instead of being removed like you would in dismissing. So this could be a good way to build your collection of cards or your collection of workers a little bit uh, allowing you to kind of customize what actions you want to do uh, and get some ones that are kind of better than the ones you start off with. All right, so next action we can do, let's cover um, manuscripts. Manuscripts can only be built from the inside track here. And you will have to pay in manuscript symbols or inkwells the number shown on the corner here. So let's pick up the stack here. I don't want to reveal what's underneath so I don't spoil my game. But there is a, a number here, like this one is three crosses. If I pay this out of symbols or inkwells, I will gain this little token into my collection. They are worth a, a set collection bonus as well. Uh, you can have multiple sets going at once. And for each color in the set, uh, you'll gain points shown. So if you have all four colors, that's 16 points. The color is shown on the little bookmark and there's an immediate bonus the moment you acquire. These are set up in a particular way with a, a lighter colored one that is kind of like a starting manuscript on top. And of course there are the bonuses if you're the first person to complete three manuscripts of, of the same color. Take the associated bonus and then have a uh, permanent icons towards certain actions. So that's quite good. It's a good thing to go towards. There are also some of these manuscripts that will have a end game scoring condition. So do watch out for those. There can be potentially a fair amount of points acquired from those at the end of the game. All right, last and final action is going to the castle. To do this, you also have to be somewhere within the inner circle. And then you're going to use these gold kind of fleur-de-lis symbols as shown here, like in the square. 
And the number of workers you can send into the castle is based on this little chart here. It goes uh, 1358. If you do not have the symbols on your board or in your collection, uh, like for example, underneath the building, you can pay the rest in gold. So going into the castle, what you're gonna do is you're gonna add the correct number of workers. Uh, say for example, I have a combination of five symbols in gold. They enter in on the space that is shown here. Uh, I'm gonna put in a couple of opponent ones just to show what happens. Yeah, so I'm paying five. I'm gonna put my three workers in here. Whenever, uh, there can only ever be three workers in one spot, but that is resolved at the end of the turn. First thing you're gonna look at is whether you have three workers of your own color, in which case they're gonna split, kind of like, a, like playing pool or billiards. One is going to advance, getting you one of the bonuses shown on that tile, and the other two are gonna bounce in either direction around the castle. This can trigger additional splitting if I had more workers in different places of the castle. So you can kind of combo and chain multiple things at once. On the second tier, if you have three of the same color, and instead of splitting, one of them will get bumped up into the center of the castle, gaining the bonus shown here. If you're the first person in the center, you also gain this bonus card, giving you five points at the end of the game, and an increased hand size. Getting to the center of the castle prevents you from being removed from the castle. You are safe there. Because uh, what will happen is that if there are more characters than uh, allowed in an area, so let's just set up the condition here. So for example, here we have two yellows and two red characters in the castle. They can only be three in each segment though. So someone's gotta go home. I could choose to send myself home or my opponent. And the a reward will be given to the player who owns that meeple based on which area they're in. If they're in the outer ring, they will gain two coins. If they are in the middle ring, they will get one virtue advancement and a resource of their choice. Uh, the, it is worth it, uh, worth points to have characters in the castle though, so you don't necessarily want to be bumping your own out too often. All right, and lastly, at the end of the game, you'll score everything with the gold symbols. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, and clashing. Um, after your, at the end of your turn, before you redraw cards, you will cover clashing. So any player who has uh, actually, or just the active player. If you, your tokens, like your black and white, your sin and your virtue tokens, meet each other, they're gonna kind of glue together and they're gonna move together for the rest of your turn. And then at the end of your turn, during that phase, where I'm following kind of the order here of actions, you will resolve a clash based on where the combined token is. You, what you will get, what is at the top, so in this case, I would get a coin and one of these deed cards, and every other player will get what's at the bottom. So what we have at the bottom is if you have one or more of these uh, nefarious purple skulls, you'll get a, a sin movement. If you have no purple skulls, you'll probably get a virtual movement, and occasionally some cards on the outside. You'll see that if you manage to push your tokens to the far ends, this is a very quick way to get a lot of cards, which of course can be dangerous, especially if they are debts, because they are worth negative points until you flip them. Also, none of them will score towards the end game conditions uh, unless you have them flipped. And flipping is not always the easiest in this game. So beware of that. Okay, so now I'm gonna cover the rules for solo play. If you wanna skip to the end to watch my review or watch the playthrough, you, you can do so now. Solo play is uh, much like the two-player setup, like I mentioned, except the AI will use the opposite side of the board. Each board has a slightly different flavored AI. You can kind of see what they focus on in the top left corner. This time I selected the builder, so he is going to be probably primarily building things. Their starting resources are shown here. 
as well as certain cards will be removed either from their beginning cards deck or their advanced or future cards deck. The after you select your your own starting resources and leader, the card that you did not select will dictate where they end up. Um, and I should mention that um, just like in the multiplayer, if either the opponent ends up in the same space as you, you get to reorganize your kind of player board, uh, like the, the three cards are set there, or if you land on their space, they'll get a bonus. How the AI works is that on their turn, they'll sh push cards down just like you would, reveal a new card that will show kind of what action that they're going to be doing uh, or attempt. So first they will do certain actions like acquiring a new card from their future deck, moving a certain number of spaces. Uh, then they will attempt to do the action shown or if they can't, they will, for example, flip a, re flip a card or gain, and gain a resource. Uh, they are always prioritize whatever card they have flipped the least amount of or the death cards, I believe. Also, whenever they gain any kind of bonuses uh, around the board for doing different actions or for dismissing characters uh, or some such, you'll follow this little chart here that shows that, you know, they do one of these things, then they gain a resource, they do one of these, they flip, they do one of these, they move to get a virtue. Oh yes, that's, uh, yeah, so they'll, they'll flip over a debt card before they flip deed cards. And that's pretty much it. They, they do play fairly similar to human player um, with not a lot of downtime time or, or resource counting. There is a uh, kind of a resource gathering chart as well shown here uh, that shows which resources they will get. Uh, for example, here it says that they will accumulate six stone and then they'll go for four gold and then they'll get inkwells after that. So they do need to have resources in order to pay for stuff. So they're they pretty much following the same rules you do, but their turns are, are fairly swift. And that was Viscounts of the West Kingdom, the third game in the West Kingdom series. And uh, as, as far as uh, my opinions go, uh, all three are the straight winners. Uh, I'll probably cover the other two later on the, on the channel. But I, I thought it was sort of Viscounts because I heard that uh, there's an expansion coming to Kickstarter in January or something. But it's also uh, has become my favorite of the three, and uh, and really all of all of Shem Phillips games so far, uh, this one has become my favorite. Um, it is hard to describe why, but I, I there's so many neat things that I just bring together, kind of some, like a, a sum that's greater than its parts. Uh, I mean. Not only does the game visually look great, D'Amico or D'Amico has always done a fantastic job of his artwork. Uh, he's done the other West Kingdom series games, and and a ton of other stuff. The guy is uh, unrelenting. He's a prolific artwork artist who does just amazing work across the board. Uh, but anyways, the the iconography is well plentiful. is is still very clear, uh, and and pretty precise on how things go. There's lots of kind of visual cues or reminders on the board itself that um, that really help, you know, to, both for the teach of the game as well as playing the game. And uh, as far as, as complex as the game is, um, it is actually it's probably in medium in terms of the three games. Architects would be the least complex, and Paladins is probably the most. Um, hardest to wrap your head around anyways, maybe not uh, complex rules wise. But for a game that is so meaty and has a lot of really interesting decisions, uh, it's, it's not as hard as you would think to teach. Like you card slide, you place a new one. You look at how many icons you have, you look at how far you have to move, and you go do an action. Uh, it is, you know, like each individual turn is relatively fast in what you're doing, but there's room for both long-term strategic decisions where you are kind of building your deck, going after set collections of manuscripts, which I, I didn't really cut, touch much on this game, but I have definitely played games of this where I've gotten a bunch of manuscripts. 
uh, you know, the castle, the buildings, like there's definitely long-term goals to go towards, but also a lot of very interesting media tactical decisions where you are really limited by the movement around the board uh, and the and resources you have. Uh, you know, be only be able to move like two or three spaces. Uh, you know, you would think initially that this upgrade of being able to move up to one extra space would be, you know, pretty minor, but I used it nearly every turn to get where I want to. Uh, it was it was pretty huge because otherwise you're, you're spending coins to boost your travel to get to the spot where you want to, whether it's that prime castle entry position or over to a place that actually has available building spaces left, uh, you know, or to a manuscript that w works with your set collection. Being able to move around the board is, is such a, a kind of a tasty decision. And then like the icing on the cake is the additional actions that cards do. You know, do I want to play, you know, the princess right now so I can get an immediate boost on my virtue? Or do I want to put a trader down so I can get some ongoing income whenever I take trading actions? Uh, and, and there's there's so many more decisions along with that. Having to uh, you know kind of build your deck a little bit. I did get to thin some cards out, so I wasn't doing quite as much building later on or the master building. But I you know my deck got a little leaner. I got to the cards I needed faster, so I was able to get a whole bunch of stuff in the castle when I needed to, which uh, didn't win me the game. But I got up to a point where I'm only four points away from an AI that looked like it massacred me. <laughs> I actually did surprisingly uh, well for, for how I thought I did. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, so the iconography is great. The 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 turn-by-turn -turn actions are, are very interesting. And, uh, you know, the castle can be a little fiddly when there are a lot of meeples in the castle. It can be, it can be difficult to get them all in there. Uh, and I have definitely played a, a four-player game of this where you, you may want to take the ones out of the middle eventually and kind of put them somewhere special because it gets a little, it could get potentially a little full if there's a lot of people going for castle. But usually if, there, if there's people going for castle, you probably want to do something else because now you have like the run of the board for buildings or to get the manuscripts you need. And it, uh, you know, it, it plays well off of knowing what other people are going for and doing something different. There is a, a bit of a, what you would call a point salad factor in this game where you were getting points from a lot of different sources. Uh, but I don't think it's it's that big a deal because you are, uh, you do have some clear objectives you are going towards. You're not just kind of taking it as it comes and just doing, there's no like this immediate obvious choice of, of like, this is clearly the best actions. Some games will fall to that uh, trap where, uh, you know, the game almost plays itself because there's always one best action to do. Uh, that, that is not the case here. There's, you know, decide do I want to go, uh, you know, start building up and ramping up my, my traders, my market uh, cards so I can go and get a whole bunch of resources. Or do I want to take some lesser actions now, but just to get what I want faster. I, uh, I do find that the Depending on your play style, you may or may not go for the skulls. Uh, some people I've played with love them because they, they do count as a wild and uh, you, you'll have such a tremendous boost in your action ability. Having, you know, one or two wilds on your board means you don't have to pivot or you don't have to take so long to pivot. Yeah, you know, you can pivot on a dime and pretty much do what, what action you want when you want. And the trade-off is that is you get more and more of these black token movements, the sin, which gets you more of those debt cards, which can lose you some points, but you know maybe that was uh, maybe that was the course to go. Like uh, if I saw that the AI was hoarding debt cards um, or, or was starting to build up a lot of debt cards quickly or was heading in that direction anyways, maybe I should have went for more of those skulls, which would have pushed me up the opposite end of the track, gotten me more debt cards, and perhaps allowed me to beat them. You know, it, it, uh, it could have happened, but the, 
the choices there. Um, this idea of like light versus dark, you know, sin and virtue has been through. It's definitely in Architects. Uh, it's there's, it's not really in in Paladins, but it is still an interesting concept of of uh, you know different characters have different sway and. Also, the uh, the variable in-game trigger. Let's talk about that for a second. The fact that you are going for uh, prosperity or, um, you know, or, or what's the other one? Poor, poorness or something? <clears throat> You're trying to run out either the red or the black cards. And which, when one of those runs out, the game uh, end will trigger. That is, in itself, uh, a very interesting, unique game mechanic, which I haven't seen a whole lot of, where... If everyone is going for one thing, the other thing is what scores, bonus, like uh, the end game victory, kind of additional points. And uh, so it really rewards paying attention to what other players are doing. Uh, not just because you may not necessarily want to give them some free reorders by landing on their spot, but seeing that, like I said, if you are getting a lot of one certain type of card, uh, you know, like red, you want to get more black because they're going to. You know, three players are all piling on the red cards. They're clearly going to reveal the virtue card, meaning the black ones are worth more points. And you may want to go in the opposite direction. So uh, again, very interesting choices. Uh, the board is modular. These things will change up uh, position randomly as well as can flip to the correct sides. So it definitely, it definitely scales for player count a little better, uh, which, which is super neat. And uh, I'm excited to see what the expansions have. I don't really know anything uh, about them, but um, I am looking forward to seeing it. Uh, components are all quite nice. The cards are linen finish. Tokens are pretty thick. The resources are all shaped, and there's a decent amount of them. Uh, you know, meeples are nicely colored and shaped. Art is great. The little plastic castle, um, while it's not especially large, it does actually kind of lock up the board. I don't know if you guys can see this here, but it does uh, kind of slot in and allow you to lock these wings in so they don't they don't move around during gameplay, um, which, is, which is nice. Um, you know, I've played some games where the board shifts around. <laughs> Be crazy. And all this fits into a, a very small size box. You know, the, it's a kind of smaller than your ticket to ride size box. It's your typical Garp Hill games box. So anyways, uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, theme wise, it's probably not super thematic. I mean, the trait, like, it, it, the characters make sense. You know, the, the princess belongs to the castle. She's got more sway there and she's virtuous and kind. Uh, you know, whereas like the trader is good at money pinching, um, and he'll get you, you know, help you get your resources. So stuff like that works. Why we're running around the kingdom, building different places? I guess, I don't know. I guess because we're we're viscounts and we are helping manage the kingdom or something. In theory, there's some king somewhere that we're trying to please. Uh, you know, maybe that's what the king victory card is. I don't know. It uh, it works for me. Uh, I do very much enjoy it, and the, the, the play time was not especially long. Uh, it doesn't get too much longer for multiple players because you do run out the deck of cards faster. So, um, or or at least it, you, there are more people working towards running it out, even if there is more cards in it. And it's not a, a short game, but I think that's fine. Uh, as far as solo AI, let me address that for a second. Uh, the solo AI, as you saw, was pretty smooth. Uh, I mean, it did simulate a player, which is different than an AI that just kind of does its own thing and cheats to make it faster. So the AI does have a little bit more going on in their turn than, than sometimes, I, sometimes I like, but it was smooth enough to handle with the decision space on the cards. It is easy enough to manage that. I, st I still didn't mind it. Um, you know, and, and I did appreciate that it was playing like a human would, where it was it was kicking off my units from the castle. I got lost a lot of points doing that. I got some back later. It was blocking up building spaces. It was taking manuscripts. You know, I think uh, I think that way it succeeds. The AI boards 
Uh, each limb is a little bit different and will score a little bit differently depending on, uh, you know, so building order is uh, sometimes a little bit different as well as uh, what actions they'll take is a little bit different because their, their deck is built slightly differently or their starting resources are a little bit different. So I do like how there's different kind of flavor of AI that you can try out your hand against. And, uh, you know, it, this, and this was the builder, you build everything but two. So that was pretty successful. Uh, it didn't do a lot of manuscripts though, but, oh well. Uh, so I think the, the AI does succeed very well in what it does. And uh, if you're looking for, for a game that does simulate the multiplayer experience or even multiplayer, this plays excellent at, at all player accounts I've played it at. So uh, yeah, highly recommended, check it out. Uh, I have done one other game from kind of this line, I guess you could call it. He's not part of the West Kingdom series, but I've done the Raiders of Scythia. Uh, feel free to check out my playthrough review of that as well. And uh, if I end up cutting the playthrough from this video because it's too long, then uh, check out my playthrough too. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Uh, let me know if you're looking forward to the next game in uh, from this kind of line of games from Shem Phillips. I think they're heading towards the um, towards the south, the south now with the um, the Tigris. Um, I forget the exact name of the game, but I think they're they're heading down to the Tigris and to the south with some more interesting looking games coming out sometime next year. So uh, let me know if uh, any of those seem interesting to you. And uh, have a great week and play more games.